Church. Happy Sabbath. Happy Sabbath. About a thousand comedians out of work, and everybody wants to meet one. <laughs> Anyhow, you know, I'm uh, also, I, this is kind of weird having everything the way it is and getting hemmed into this pulpit. Not my style, but it's what I'll be today. Um, I too am thankful that Jesus came the first time because if he didn't come the first time, it'd be no good to come the second time, right? So, um, I want you all to realize that uh, we are created, this is what the message is today, created to display his glory. That is our purpose in life, to display his glory. And we are uh, earthen vessels. I'm a pretty cracked one, let me tell you. I mean, I've got probably, I don't know the exact number, but if it's not five million, it's right there. Miles going forward. Probably quite a few going backwards. This week, it's dark out. I'm in my motorhome sitting in my driveway. And uh, I'm not happy because my wife's sitting in the car and she's not moving like I think she should be moving. And she finally does move, and when she does, so do I. But oh man, dark, raining, can't see out of the mirror, and I turn that motor home right out of my driveway, and I hear this. Oh, no. I look in the back, see something falling off and fell. I park, I get out, sure enough, there's my mailbox. <laughs> and I don't have just a cheapy mailbox, I got a nice Aunt Amish mailbox that you could drive a tractor trailer over. So, you know, it put a nice gouge about 12 feet long on my motor home, took the paint off. And then the mailbox was still standing until my wife touched it and then it fell over. <laughs> <laughs> it's her fault. Yes, it's her fault. That's what I said. But, um, you know, attitude. What is our attitude? What is our attitude with other people? You know, how do we handle stress? Um, do we realize that we're created to display God's glory? That's, that's our purpose in life. That's a pretty high calling, you know? And uh, I'm going to touch on uh, some things in this message about our part. And, you know, that's not a comfortable thing that, that ministers like to get on. So most people steer clear of this. But um, God has made me for some difficult things, I think, because I'm just a difficult feller. And, uh, if I was God, I'd have gave up on me a long time ago, but thank God he's so patient and kind and loving, and he continues to work with me. Amen. 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 He's put many things in my life to uh, try to straighten me out. Anyways, um, let all the glory be to him. Uh, if you're still in Isaiah 43, I would like to uh, go ahead and read a little more than we just read. I want to begin in verse 5. It says, Fear not, for I am with thee. Right? Does that not give us confidence and strength? I will bring thy seed from the east and gather thee from the west. I will say to the north, give up, and to the south, keep not back. Bring my sons from far and my daughters from the ends of the earth. Even everyone that is called by my name, for I have created him for my glory. I have formed him, yea, I have made him. Um, God requires us. I, you know, we've had this discussion in Sabbath school, and require uh, commandment, uh, instruction, Please, brothers and sisters, don't get hung up on a word and let it ruin your day, okay? Jesus loves us. He does not want to uh, destroy us. That's not his purpose. Jesus came to save us. Amen. He gave his life to do that. I mean, Jesus, a lot of people understand, well, Jesus died for my sins. No. He, he died your death. Amen. Okay? He lived your life. God only accepts absolute perfection and it's only found in Jesus Christ. Amen. So Amen. there's nothing I can do to be saved. Jesus did it. If I choose to die in my sins, I don't even die for my sins. 
I die for the lack of belief. I die for unbelief because Jesus died for my sins. Mm. This is the most greatest transaction you could ever have. Jesus says, look, give me them sins, I give you my life. Hallelujah. How can you lose? Wait, wait. So there is a hell to shun and a heaven to win. Amen. You know, if we choose to hold on to sin, it will destroy us. Amen. What we do not overcome, brothers and sisters, will overcome us. Mm -hmm. And me being upset with my wife, because I didn't think she was moving fast enough, was ridiculous. I mean, I should, I, how long, how old do I got to be before I learn this lesson? Chill out, man. <laughs> Relax. Take some paper towels and wipe that mirror off while you're waiting for her. You don't think she didn't move fast enough, right? Mm -hmm. I mean, come on. What's it going to be? Right. So, uh, I mean, I was so mad at myself, I could have kicked my butt for the last next three miles out of the way driving that thing. I'm like, I can't believe you did that. Mm -hmm. You know? I know better. But a moment. Mm -hmm. See, this is, this, is the, this is supposed to be the Christian's life. Not, not everything is like that. The ring and tone of your life is supposed to be victory, victory, victory. There may be something that just, oops, boom, there was a slip. And you get back up again. But that slip isn't the constant ring and tone of your life. Mm -hmm. I mean, if every day I'm getting mad at my wife <coughs> and breaking things, there's probably a problem. Big problem. Right? Yeah. So, I want you to turn to Matthew um, chapter... I want to turn to Matthew chapter 5. This is the greatest sermon ever told, given by the greatest preacher who ever lived, right? Amen. Jesus. It's all in red. And in verse uh, 48 of chapter 5, it says what? Be ye therefore perfect, even as your Father which is in heaven is perfect. Right? Right? The word there for perfect, in the Hebrew, it is shalom. And there's many different ways to spell it and pronounce it, but I'm going to call it shalom, okay? Um, is a Hebrew word meaning peace, harmony, wholeness, completeness. You hear in victory in there? Wholeness, completeness. Prosperity, welfare, tranquility, and it can be used idiomatically to mean both hello and goodbye. What a beautiful word, right? Think about that. It's a deep, beautiful word. Uh, the Hawaiians have a word, they say, what, aloha, right? And what does that mean? Yeah, it's another beautiful word. Um, but not just with you. Shalom is the Hebrew in the Greek. The word is teleos, and it means brought to its end, finished, wanting nothing necessary to completeness. Perfect. Ooh. That which is perfect consummate human integrity. Um, words do mean things. You know, they do mean things. But... We don't need to get hung up on such words that just ruin our day. Um, realize that we're all earthen <laughs> vessels, that we make mistakes, but as long as we're looking at Jesus, everything's going to be fine. Amen. He, as long as he's driving, we're going to get there. We're going to be all right. But if you're behind the wheel, especially me and that motorhome, and the devil comes along, guess what's going to happen? You're going to wipe out the mailbox, you're going to blow tires, you're going to be real mad. But if Jesus is driving, I can clean the mirror and just watch him. <laughs> right? Oh, it's beautiful. Okay. Um, Noah. What, what does the Bible say about Noah? Who is this fellow? Let's go to Genesis 6 and chapter, uh, chapter 6, verse 9. It's really difficult for me to stand in one place. I want you to know that. I'll get there. Amen. Verse 6 and 9. But, but what does it say? It says, but Noah, I'm going to read verse 8. 
but Noah found grace in the eyes of the Lord. These are the generations of Noah. Noah was a what? A just and a... My Bible says perfect, upright, okay, perfect in his generations. And Noah walked with God. Perfect. Okay, is God, would God ask us to do something that we couldn't do? That he wouldn't enable us or give us the grace to be able to do? He's, as he's telling us, be ye therefore perfect. Right here we're hearing that Noah is perfect. What about Abraham? What about that fellow? Um, maybe Genesis 17, 1. Let's go to Genesis 17, 1. And it says, And when Abraham was 90 years old, in 9, 99, okay, the Lord appeared to Abram and said unto him, I am the Almighty God. Walk before me and be thou what? Perfect. He's asking Abraham to be perfect. Um, how about Job? Job, um, Job 1 1. Here it is. It says, There was a man in the land of Uz whose name was Job, and that man was perfect and upright, and one that feared God and eschewest evil. Wow. It, it sounds kind of different when you think of it this way, doesn't it? Mm -hmm. I mean, does it mean that these guys didn't make mistakes at all? Because I, I don't know, when you get to the end of Job, man, God really takes Job to the woodshed. I mean, I really felt sorry for Job when I was reading some of that. Um, I, I want to read <coughs> Job 9, 20 and 21. Job says, if I justify myself, my own mouth shall condemn me. If I say I am perfect, it shall also prove me perverse. You hear it? Yeah. Though I were perfect, yet would I not know my soul, I would despise my life. And that's why God's calling this man perfect. Why? I want you to hear this, I want you to see this. They, he and us, we should have a right attitude with God. Do you follow me? It's not saying that we're not going to make a mistake. It's not going to say that we don't fall. But that's not the ring and tone of your life. You have a right attitude with God. You're in agreement with God. When God says that you're, you're blind, you don't say, I can see. When God says you're deaf, you don't say, I can hear. You follow me? We have the right attitude with God, and we listen. This is the thing we need to do. If I would have been listening that night, it was raining, I wouldn't have that mark on my motorhome that I get to see all for the next two weeks. Which will remind me that I got a lot to learn. God uses that little voice to, to straighten me out, too. Okay. Um, let us turn to Luke. I'm just going to kind of let the scripture uh, explain itself. I don't, I'm don't. i not here to decipher and tell you what the Bible says. The Bible can speak for itself, correct? Yeah. Luke 1 and 6, and it says... And they were both righteous before God, walking in all the commandments and ordinances of the Lord, what? Blameless. Blameless. Wow. What a testimony, huh? Okay. But as we read, right there where it says blameless, then we go on and we find out, in verse 20 it says what? And behold, thou shalt be dumb and not be able to speak until the day that these things shall be performed because thou believest not my works which shall be fulfilled in their season. John the Baptist was coming in through, through these two, Zacharias and Elizabeth, right? Says that they were what? What did it say in that verse? In verse 9? Blameless. Blameless. Verse 6. Blameless, right? But then here you go. He doesn't believe Gabriel. 
he, maybe he snickers, whatever it is, right? And Gabriel says, you shall not, you're not going to be able to speak. You're going to be dumb until the baby's born. Are you hearing it? I'm not saying to you guys that you're not going to heaven if you're not absolutely perfect. And you're not walking out these doors in absolute perfection here. But God is calling us to perfection. And that perfection comes in having the right attitude with God. So if Gabriel comes to you and you're 90 years old and he says, Andrea, you're going to have another baby. <laughs> Don't laugh. <laughs> Don't laugh. Just say, may it be unto me as you're speaking or spoken. Right? That's what Mary did. She was blessed, right? She did not, she did not say no. There, there's a contrast there, right? We, we have to be in the right attitude. Let's turn to Romans. Romans uh, chapter 8. Is it okay to thumb through your Bible today? Amen. Some scriptures? Amen. Romans uh, chapter 8, and I'm going to begin in verse 28. And we know all things work together for good to them that love God and to them who are called according to his purpose. For whom he did foreknow, he also did predestinate to conform to the image of his Son, that he might be the firstborn among many brethren. Do we believe in predestination? I, we, we ought to. We ought to believe in the right predestination. What is the right predestination? God would have all men to be saved. Right? Not some men. The Bible says all men. All right. Man's extremity is God's opportunity. God's part. What is God's part? God's part is to do for man what he cannot do for himself. That's it. In a nutshell. That's God's part. So the way we do that is to allow him to have the driver's seat. Because, as you know, even if you got five million miles under your belt, you can still pull out of your own driveway and take out a mailbox. I can't believe it. I'm so amazed. <laughs> I'm just so amazed. I feel like such an idiot. I just can't believe it. Um, God is so tender with me. I mean, it could have been a lot worse, right? But he uses things like this. He knows. He knows me. And that scratch is going to drive me nuts. It's the, it's the little things that just, whoo, I, I don't take them very well. I mean, I can come in and these body parts can be all over the place, and I'd be okay with that. But some little stupid thing just drive me out of my mind. That, that's just how I'm wired. What do you want to say, Kyla? Please don't embarrass me. <laughs> Yeah, I, I asked my neighbor, I says, look, bud, please. I says, I bought this mailbox before you bought that house and put this thing all up. I says, if you could be so kind as to just do whatever it takes to rebuild that mailbox. Cause it, I mean, the mailboxes themselves, like I say, they're quarter inch steel. I mean, you drive a truck over these things, but the rest of it wasn't so good. I asked him to go ahead and please fix it. Whatever it took, I paid. And he just gracefully did. And I asked him what I owed him, he said, nothing. So, anyways? Yeah, really. Praise the Lord. So, anyways. Ask him to fix your motor home coaster. <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to fix my motor home. You know, because with motor homes, you know how they got all that, like, tribal stuff all over there that, you know, it's got a mark on there that's, I mean, all I need is a little piece of vinyl. That thing's gone. Praise the Lord. <laughs> Praise the Lord. All right, let's let's turn to John. Uh, I love the book of John. John chapter six. Okay, because I talked about God's part. I want to talk about our part for a second. Right? John chapter six, and let's go to verse twenty-eight. Then said they unto him, "They're speaking to Jesus." 
scribes and Pharisees, what shall we do that we might work the works of God? Jesus answered and said unto them, This is the work of God, that ye believe on him whom he hath sent. You hear that? Yeah. That's our part. But what does our part mean? Just to simply have a mental effect, a scent? And I know I run into a lot of people that say, oh, I believe in Jesus. <coughs> what does it mean to say, I believe in Jesus? The Bible says, all those who call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. That doesn't just mean say, oh, Lord, save me. It means the ring and tone of your life is a constant dependence upon Jesus for your salvation. You hear it? Yeah. Yeah. If I'm looking to Him and I'm looking at Him, it's very difficult to sin. You follow me? I can't be with my wife, holding her hands, looking her in the eye, and checking out other women. I mean, you don't think she's going to notice that my focus isn't on her? How do you think God feels? He says, listen, you, I, I want it all or nothing. Amen. He wants first place because he won't take second. Amen. Amen. And if we give him first place, we are going to be so in love, starstruck. Remember when you fell in love? Maybe when you first... I saw the light, as the song says. Remember what it was like? Why does that have to wane? Why does it have to go away? Well, why? 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 Because of our attitude. Because of how we see things. Our perceptions on things causes us to be happy or unhappy. You know? My perception that night was that my wife was going to get going because I had to get going. And she didn't move fast enough. So what happened? I caused myself a lot of grief. And I go ahead and air my own dirty laundry so nobody else can do it for me. So. <laughs> Listen, God has the power to create, and He has the power to recreate. But we have to give Him permission. Because, you know, God is the perfect gentleman. Yes. He will never force his way out. Right. He says, this here is the way walk ye in it. We can choose not to walk in it. To our own demise. Mm -hmm. But God is wooing us. He's been wooing us before we were born. Amen. Imagine how wonderful he is. Think about it. Dream about him. Long for him. He, if, if he is the desire of your heart, think about what that would be like. Think about that. If he was the center piece of your desires, do you think you would not be filled? How much do you want to give to your children? How much do you, you know, I see people wrapping presents. I want to give to my kids. They love it. They're so excited. They get so charged up about it. And we're just human beings with evil natures. What do you think it's like for God? He says in his word, what? He is more willing to give the Holy Spirit than we are even to ask for him. But Peter says... You read Peter, Peter says in Acts that we, he gives the Holy Spirit to those who what? Obey him. Obey him. What does obey mean? Listen. Listen intently. You know? If, if you really care about the instruction, you're going to get it. And then you're going to want to do it because it means so much to you. You know? What we really ought to fear brothers and sisters, is not God destroying us. What we ought to fear more than anything in this galaxy is the frown of God upon our life. That God would frown upon us. Think about that moment. I, I just get chills up right down my whole body right now just thinking about the time when Peter forsook his Lord and Jesus looked at him 
from afar. Can you imagine what that must have felt like for him? Can you imagine? So he went out bitter and crying wet. That's what we don't want. That's what we ought to fear. You should fear no man. Even fear no woman, even though they can be more fierce than a man. Amen. Careful. Careful now. Fear. Yeah, I'm stepping on toes now. I hate looking. I, I'm, I'm heading off for two weeks with five females. Three three human and two feline. <laughs> so, God help me. Please pray for me. <laughs> anyway, that was a joke. Come on. Alright, so let's go to 2 Corinthians 3.18.
Colossians chapter 2, I'm going to begin in verse 8. Y'all there? Beware lest any man spoil you through philosophy and vain deceit, after the tradition of men, after the rudiments of the world, and not after Christ. <coughs> this is where people get into trouble. They get into the extra biblical stuff. This is where the rabbi, we, we talked about this a little bit in status school, you know, there was 600.